In this video, I will be performing the suite in G minor by Grégoire G. In its present form, the suite has three movements, all composed in 2015. Allemand, Courante, and Sarabande. The Sarabande, incidentally, is in the relative key of B flat major. G is planning to add a gigue in the future, and I hope to feature that piece in a future video. When I posted a video of Jay's The Phantom of Goldberg, and I will put a link to that video in the video description, I described the compositional style as a compelling amalgam of Baroque gestures and contemporary harmonic practice. This description certainly fits the suite as well, Although here, contemporary harmonic elements are not as prominent. Rather, they're used in select moments to add extra richness to the harmony. I would like to briefly highlight three features concerning the individual movements and then spend a little more time discussing rhythmic flexibility, especially as it relates to the sarabande. The first feature all three movements have in common is that they are fairly expansive. So in terms of dimensions, they are certainly closer to 18th rather than 17th century repertory. The second feature involves the presence of fantasia-like elements in the Allemand and the Courant. In both movements, these elements occur in the second section and involve passages in which the rhythmic and melodic flow of the movement is transformed into arpeggiated chordal figurations. Let me briefly demonstrate. So um, what happens in the Almond is this, and I will start a couple of measures before the Fantasia-like section, and I will alert you to it when I get to it. right here. Etc. Etc. Now in the Quran we have something slightly similar. So let me now get to the Quran again. I will start a few measures before the fantasia-like section. And it's right here. again, etc, etc. The third feature concerns the use of repeats, which are progressively reduced from movement to movement. Thus, in the Allemande, both sections are repeated, while in the Courant, only the first section is repeated, and finally, in the Sarabande, neither of the two sections is repeated. Let's turn now to the use of rhythmic flexibility, something also frequently referred to as tempo rubato. Of course, this is a complex topic that can be approached from a variety of perspectives and is also dependent on musical context. So what I would like to do here is offer a few personal suggestions, which I will then demonstrate with the sarabande. Mainly, what I would like to suggest is to approach rhythmic flexibility in a different way compared to traditional thinking. The 20th and by extension 21st century traditional musical aesthetic tends to approach rhythmic flexibility from a melodic standpoint, 
meaning that interpretative decisions prioritize the melody with the harmony usually following and rhythmically conforming to the melodic line. If we translate this aesthetic to keyboard instruments, decisions regarding rhythmic flexibility tend to concentrate on the melodic material usually presented by the right hand with the more harmonically oriented left hand adjusting accordingly so that it fits with what the right hand does. Several pre-20th century sources suggest a fundamentally different approach whereupon the left hand maintains a steady beat while the right hand can be flexible rhythmically within beats or in terms of a particular phrase but ultimately has to align itself with the left hand. What happens, in other words, is what I like to think of as a more harmonically based approach to rhythmic flexibility, where it is the left hand that shapes the rhythmic narrative, so to speak, of the piece. This approach also accounts for one notable performing convention we hear in early 20th century recordings, which in many respects preserve the performing style of 19th century musicians. This convention is commonly referred to as dislocation, meaning that the two hands are frequently not aligned or synchronized with each other. Think of it as the right hand dancing around a more steady left hand, which is what causes the dislocation. However, something else these early recordings intimate is that while the left hand may not follow the right hand, it also does not remain as rhythmically steady as the reading of historical sources would lead us to believe. This leads to the realization that written sources, even though they provide invaluable information, cannot perfectly describe a performing style or performing conventions. So in the end, as performers, we also have to use our imagination. Now, obviously, 19th century performing conventions are very different from Baroque performing conventions. And since Jay's suite is informed by the Baroque style, I personally choose to perform it as if it were an actual Baroque composition. However, the notion of the left hand or the harmony providing the rhythmic foundation in a performance is a common thread that we find in Baroque historical sources as well. So what I would like to do now is show you how I approach rhythmic flexibility by looking at the sarabande from the suite. As always, keep in mind this is my own means of approaching this issue. Incidentally, the reason I have chosen to look at the sarabande is because if you look at the left hand, it mostly consists of a regular rhythmic motion consisting of eighth notes. So we have this type of thing. Etc. Etc. So I think that within this context, I can explain a little better what I am doing. So the first thing I wanted to mention is that when we have a Baroque score, we interpret a musical line also based on metric hierarchy and, of course, in the case of the Sarabande, also to where the strong beats lie. And I know this is another perhaps thorny issue in some respects, but let me say right now that in a Sarabande, yes, the second beat is very important, but sometimes the first beat can be almost equally important. And if you could ever see a sarabande being danced, you would know what I mean. And I'm not going to demonstrate uh, how a sarabande is danced. Um, but when we have something like this, um, the first thing that I'm going to do, even if I keep a steady beat, 
is that I'm going to emphasize the first and the second beat by holding on to those particular notes that fall on those beats. So something like this. <laughs> So um, the next thing now that I'm going to do is I'm going to play um, a few measures from the beginning of the sarabande. And what I want to do, first of all, is try to maintain a completely, or at least as much as I can, a completely steady beat in the left hand. But then I am going to have the right hand kind of, as I mentioned before, dancing around it. So I can still be metrically free with the right hand but in the end I have to always try to conform or fall back to what the left hand is doing meaning that there's also going to be a lot of this type of dislocation that I mentioned before <laughs> So you can actually, I would say, be expressive this way, even if you keep a fairly steady beat. Now, the next thing that I would do here is to kind of think a little bit like a 19th century musician. And again, I know that this is not 19th century style, but at least I think we can be inspired somehow by what we hear in some of these early recordings and kind of think about being flexible with the left hand in terms of what it is doing harmonically. So, for example, at the beginning... I can keep a fairly steady beat. Because we don't really have much of a change. We are basically kind of going up by step in every measure. But what happens is if we continue, now that one is something very different here, to me at least. I really want to enjoy that very wonderful seventh leap. So that is definitely one spot that I would kind of slow down a little bit with the left hand. And um, obviously now you can do other micro adjustments before that. It doesn't mean that the first one, two, three, four, five, six measures have to be perfectly steady, but I simply mean that um, the way I'm thinking of rhythmic flexibility is finding these harmonic areas that are a little richer, a little different. Uh, so when I hear something like this, I want to respond to it. And I'm still doing it with the left hand and I'm letting the right hand kind of conform to what the left hand is doing. And of course, at that spot that I play, uh, the right hand also has a very beautiful chord so so I want to enjoy it as much as I can first by slowing down this and then perhaps really spreading but notice how um, what I'm doing is I'm actually spreading the chord after the beat, not before the beat. Again, that's something a little different from uh, 20th century thinking where you could go, I go. And when 
I get there. That's another very, very beautiful moment. That's a wonderful harmony, so I want to enjoy it, and therefore, again, I'm going to take a little more time. Etc. Etc. So, in other words, what I'm trying to do is I am trying to respond to the harmony of the piece. Uh, you probably noticed also that the right hand has a lot of harmonic elements of its own, another characteristic of the Baroque style. So that also helps, uh, but this type of idea is something that I am also going to apply to the other movements of this suite, but in Baroque music in general. I just felt that this Sarabande is really a great example of this type of harmonic thinking in terms of rhythmic flexibility and something that I could demonstrate um, more easily and something that I hope you were able to hear better within this context. As always, of course, this um, has to do more with the way I approach it and the recording is going to be a little different because I don't always respond to harmonic changes the same way. Uh, but I hope that you get the idea and then perhaps you can use this as a means of exploring different expressive avenues of your own. As always, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy the performance. <laughs>